Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're going to create a moving average forecast for our single family house prices data set. Now, there may be any number of reasons why someone would, would want to do this, but that's outside the scope of what we're here to learn. So uh, let's just jump right in. So we still have the same data that we had in the previous video. If, if, if you have that available, great call it up. If not, you might want to revisit those previous ones to make sure you're at the same place. But uh, one of the simplest methods uh, for creating a forecast prediction is just to use a moving average. Now, uh, a moving average is just that. It's a moving average value that's based on some number of the previous observed values that we have available to us. And we use that moving average to make a prediction into the future. So for example, we could choose to use any number of months. Let's just go, get rid of this chart. We don't need that anymore. We could use any number of months uh, going back in the history um, to determine what our moving average value would be. Of course, the larger the window of observations, the more spread out your moving average value will be. It'll be based on a larger number of values. So in our case, we have monthly values that are indicated here. So we're going to be determining how many months into the past we want to base our moving average value on. In this case, to keep things simple, we'll just choose a simple four month moving average to start. And in, you know, if you wanted to test that or compare it against a three month moving average or a five month or a six month. Once you've got it set up, it's easy to just kind of copy and paste and then make the adjustments. And so the next question would be then, well, if we, if we have a, a four month and a three month and a five month, how do we compare them? And in the next video, we'll explore various accuracy measures that we could use to compare different models to ensure we choose the one that best fits our needs. Um, so for now, let's just, begin. So coming back in here, let me expand my Excel window. Um, we can see we've got a lot of values and going back 15 years. And I, I would be, uh, I would be inclined to say that I don't think the price of homes 15 years ago has really much of an influence on what the price of single family homes is going to be for next month. So what we can do is just take kind of a subset of this data that's relevant Maybe we go back only the last two years of data so that we have a smaller subset to work with, and then we can build our, our calculations based on that. So I'm just going to zoom down to the bottom here of our observations, November of 2020, and then we'll just go back in time to November of 2018. So we got all the way through here, and then we can get up into November 2020. So I'm going to just copy these values. And then I'm going to create a new worksheet down here at the bottom. I'm going to move down to my second column. I'll zoom in so it's a bit easier to see. And I'm going to paste these values. Okay, I left room in the top row so that I can go back here and I can copy over. Here we go. These headings. So now we just have values. It's a bit easier to see. We can view all the data on, on one screen, which is kind of nice. And we can move ahead with our calculation. So in order to do this, what we're going to need to do is add a, a couple of additional columns. So we have our dates going back in the past. What we're going to try to do is create a forecast for December, 2020, right? This is the question mark. We don't have an observation, uh, in this period, this is what we're going to try to create a forecast for. So we can have a look at what we've got here as far as data goes. We've got our periods on the left, and then we've got our values, our observations here in the right column. And so to the right of that, we're just going to add some additional uh, columns. So what I want to do is create a column to hold the average value calculation. Now this is going to depend on the number of months that we choose to include in our moving average window. Okay. And then based on that moving average, we're going to be able to create a forecast. And so eventually the forecast will be what we populate here in this uh, cell below in D27, which we would apply to our, 
our actual December value once we get a, a real observation. I don't actually want to format this. Let's just go with uh, general. I don't know. Oh, frustrating. Text. There we go. All right. Fair enough. Okay, so now that we have this set up, I'm going to actually include a, a couple of additional rows up at the top here just to clean this up. So let's insert a couple rows and then we can label this. So this is going to be Edmonton, uh, single family, I'll call it SA benchmark. And then I'll also indicate in, let's insert one more row here. Let's indicate here that we're going to create a four month moving average. All right, cool. Oops. That's not what I wanted to do. I'm a bit of a stickler for my formatting. And we don't have the periods numbered. We could add another column here to indicate this is period one, period two, but I, there's not really a, a, a reason to do that right now. So we'll just leave it alone. So what we need to do now in our average column is determine how many previous observations we're going to include to create our moving average. Now up here we decided, or I've indicated that it will be four months. So what that means is this value, the first time I can have something here in the average column, isn't going to be until the, the, the fifth observation period because I need it to be based on an average of the previous four periods. This will become our moving average value moving forward. Okay, um, I hope that makes sense. So when we look at these four values, we want to calculate an average of these and then populate here, our forecast will be based then on this particular average value. So that's pretty straightforward to do. We could just say here that the value in cell C8 is going to be equal to the average of these previous one, two, three, four values. Okay. And so now we have our average. And if we take this uh, fill handle and we drag and drop that down, it's just going to copy that and apply it to all the remaining ones. Don't worry about the, the warning here. It's just showing you that because you have adjacent cells that don't have. Um, we can deal with that here. So let's just ignore this error. Oh, can I get all of them? Oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Anyways, you can go through and clean it up. We'll just leave it for now. So once we've got this average uh, populated, it's really simple to get the forecast value. The forecast in this case for our fifth period is going to be based on this four uh, period moving average. So it's just simply equal to this particular cell in C8 in this case, and voila. Okay. And now we can take the fill handle here again, and we can drag this all the way down through our, our bottom here. So you'll notice um, this is now our forecasted value for December 2020, for which we don't have an observation. And we could, you know, apply some formatting. Let's just say this is a calculated cell, so we can identify it as such. But based on our moving average, um, this is what we would see as a forecasted value for the single value benchmark in December of 2020. Now looking at this, we'll go back in, in time and say, you know what? basing this value on the previous average um, may or may not be so good. We can see here there's clearly a trend of increasing value. So I would probably expect this value to be higher than what it is. Um, and so this is where you start to question the value from the forecast. Maybe instead of using, uh, you know, four month average, we should use two month average um, or, or six month or what have you. And just because you've employed some kind of model doesn't mean that you want to take that value at, um, at face value and just say, okay, this is the forecast value. That must be right. You want to start asking some questions. So I would immediately suggest that, you know, we might be missing something here, but we really don't know overall how well this model has performed. All we can see here are our moving average values and our forecasted prediction values. We don't really know how well this model is performing. And so that's going to be the, the subject that we're going to cover in the next video when we look at 
different error accuracy measures that we can use to see how well this model is performing. And then we'll have some kind of uh, values that we can use to compare one model against another to see if it's actually working uh, out for us in our favor.